Meanwhile, this Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps striking an alleged Israeli spy base in Iraq and Syria last night, killing four civilians. This happening just hours after a Houthi missile hit a U.S. ship off the coast of Yemen. Fortunately, there were no injuries there, no significant damage, but the Houthis are vowing to continue their attacks in the Red Sea, saying they will expand the targets now to American vessels. Joining me right now is Fox News senior strategic analyst. He is chairman of the Institute for the Study of War, General Jack Keane, with me this morning. General, always a pleasure. Thanks very much for joining us this morning. Yeah, great to be here, Maria. And I think we're up to, what, 138 attacks against U.S. Uh, servicemen and women in Iraq and Syria, General? Your reaction? Well, we, we clearly have not been able to deter the Iranian-backed militias from attacking U.S. bases uh, and U.S. interests uh, in the area. And we certainly have not been able to deter the Houthis, although I think all of us welcome the attack on Houthi capabilities recently because it was a comprehensive attack. But obviously, they've got to do much more than that. And, have I, and I've said for weeks here, we just have to recognize that the center of gravity behind all of the militia activities, all of the aggressiveness of the proxies, is Iran. Until you take Iran on directly and change our policy dealing with Iran, which has been more appeasement and diplomatic overture than anything else, and, and willing to confront them and have them pay a price with kinetic operations, not start a war with Iran, but take away some of their capabilities like we're doing with, with the Houthi proxies, then you'll start to see a tone down in, in some of these aggressive activities by the proxies. But Iran doesn't care that the proxies lose rockets and missiles. They don't care that the proxies lose actually members, because they know full well they can give them more missiles and more rockets, and they know these are radicalized groups which have no difficulty recruiting new members. So that's where we are, and it's going to continue until we take a much stronger position. So what should that position be specifically, General? I mean, Jake Sullivan is here in Davos. He's going to be speaking shortly. Uh, we know that Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin was now released from the hospital. That happened yesterday. He was there two weeks following complications from prostate cancer surgery late last month. In a statement, Austin said this, As I continue to recuperate and perform my duties, I'm eager to fully recover and return as quickly as possible to the Pentagon. While Austin was in the hospital, there were 24 attacks on U.S. troops in Iraq and Syria. As I mentioned, there have been at least 137 attacks on U.S. bases in those countries since October 17th. So you say, look, the U.S. has to be visible. What do we do in terms of specifically reacting, responding to Iran? Well, first of all, we should return to the Trump maximum sanctions that they had imposed on the regime and had a, a really significant impact on them. They were down to 200,000 barrels of oil a day. They're north of three and a half million now, some place moving in the direction of four. By the last time I checked a couple of weeks ago, that means they're flush with money. We've given them $6 billion in exchange for hostages. That's a deplorable mistake, I, I believe. So return to really tough sanctions. Work with the Arabs and the Israelis in stitching together uh, plans to confront Iran, you know, and going forward. The, the third thing is, is that we need to disrupt the movement of rockets and missiles to these militias. Uh, the Israelis have conducted over 200 strikes in, in Syria in the last couple of years doing just that, interfering with the transshipment of missiles on the ground or in the air and taking them down literally at the Damascus International Airport, and they put them in the warehouses prior to shipping them into Lebanon. We can do the same thing and be much more aggressive with the other rockets and missiles coming out of Iran, going to the Houthis, as an example. And then the third thing, which yeah. I and other observers have said, don't fear a war with Iran. They don't want any part of a war with us. That's why they have the proxies. That's the very definition of the proxies, to prevent their direct involvement. But we have to go after them directly, take down IRGC capability inside of Iran. CENTCOM, Central Command mm -hmm. who oversees this area, has plenty of targets. They have recommended plenty of targets to the administration, and the administration has held back and stiffed them on those targets. 
Those are some of the things that we can do to deal with Iran, who is the center of gravity here that is driving yeah. the lack of stability in the Middle East. That's the reality of it. Such important analysis from you, General. And then there's China uh, and the influence that it holds. The Pacific Island nation of Nauru announcing yesterday it would stop recognizing Taiwan and will instead seek formal relations with Beijing. The move coming just days after Taiwan's current vice president Lai won the nation's presidential election over the weekend. China has called him a dangerous, quote, separatist. Only 12 countries now formally recognize Taiwan. In general, you know that Xi Jinping labeled this incoming president as an instigator of war. What does that mean? Yeah, well, certainly Beijing undermined this election rather dramatically. And they tried to cast the election, Maria, in a choice between war and peace. War, if you vote for the That's right. DPP, President Lai, who won this election, President-elect Lai now, or the other parties, meaning peace. And it didn't work. I mean, th this is really good news and something that Taiwanese have a right to celebrate. They, they voted for democracy. They voted for their freedom. They know full well that they have been intimidated and coerced by President Xi and his military and his economic predators as well for the last two to three years on a level they've never seen before, mainly because they wanted the people to be so intimidated that they would vote for a more conciliatory party that wanted better relations with China and was not willing to stand up to them. Despite all of that intimidation and coercion, as you've seen, hundreds and hundreds of violation of their air interdiction zones and maritime rights, the people voted for the party that is standing up to mainland China. That's got courage, mm. and they're also telling us how important their freedom is to them, how important democracy truly is to them. They stuck it right in the eye of President Xi by voting that election. There, it's fiction yeah. that there's one China and two policies. There are two Chinas. That's the reality. One is a communist-controlled state that oppresses its own people and aggresses uh, countries in the region, and there's another one that's a thriving democracy that espouses freedom. There are two Chinas, and look what Taiwan did and voted for their own China. It, it is a wonderful thing to see them stand up, despite the intimidation and coercion that President Xi has imposed on them. Yeah, incredibly, uh, incredible moment in time right now. General, thank you so much. Great to talk with you and get your insights on all of that. We appreciate your time.